let's review some key takeaways from the episode on echoes in the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So you ordered an echo, and the report says that the patient's pulmonary artery systolic pressure, a.k.a. PASP, or right ventricular systolic pressure, a.k.a. RVSP, is high. What is actually considered high? Usually a PASP greater than or equal to about 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury is considered elevated. But when interpreting that number, it's important to know that the PASP and RVSP on echo are not direct measurements, but estimates. They're based on the physics of tricuspid regurgitation, or how fast blood leaks backward through the tricuspid valve. This gives us a ballpark of what the real pressures are, but also leaves room for error. In fact, about 50% of the time, Doppler echo estimates can be off by over 10 millimeters of mercury, compared to right heart cath measurements, which is the gold standard. So think of PASP estimation on echo as t-shirt sizes. You have small, medium, and large. It gives you a rough idea of how big it is, which is useful as an initial red flag. So if you see a PASP of 80 or so, you know that's abnormal. But the PASP is a ballpark estimate, so small changes up and down over time might not have that much clinical relevance. So what is important to trend? Right ventricle or RV size and function over time provides a much more detailed picture of how the RV is handling all that pulmonary pressure. Progressive RV dilatation is concerning and means the RV is failing to compensate for all the elevated pressures it's feeling from the pulmonary circulation. Other red flags you might see include RV hypertrophy and right atrial enlargement. One important pearl is that once the RV dilates, the PASP may actually go down due to poor cardiac squeeze. So you might think, yeah, that PASP is decreasing, but it's not necessarily a good thing because it may mean the right side of the heart is failing. In thinking of the causes of pulmonary hypertension, picture a garden hose. It's helpful to think of the three big buckets of different pathophys insults that can cause elevated pulmonary pressures. In the first bucket, we have things that increase resistance within the pulmonary vasculature. So think of kinks within the actual hose that raise the pressure. What are some things that can increase resistance in the pulmonary vasculature? Things like chronic hypoxemia, where all that low oxygen leads to vasoconstriction, can increase the resistance. We also have things that can change the pulmonary vascular bed, diseases like COPD, interstitial lung disease, and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, otherwise known as CTEF. And lastly, you can also have pulmonary arterial vasculopathy, aka PAH. Now in the second bucket, we have things that caused elevated left-sided filling pressures, This is kind of like having a faulty nozzle at the end of the hose, causing water to back up. In this bucket, left ventricular systolic or diastolic dysfunction or mitral or aortic valvular disease can cause backup and increase the pulmonary pressure. Lastly, in the third bucket, think about causes of increased flow through the pulmonary vasculature. Tying it back to our analogy, high output through that garden hose will also cause high pulmonary pressures. Some high output states include acute anemia, large AV fistulas in patients on hemodialysis, and in patients with cirrhosis where there's a low systemic vascular resistance. One important caveat here is that not every patient fits neatly into just one of these three pathophysiologic buckets. For example, patients with cirrhosis may have low systemic vascular resistance, which increases flow but they can also have elevated resistance from portopulmonary hypertension. Depending on the patient, there's also a grab bag of rarer causes from WHO group 5. This can include various hematologic disorders, including myeloproliferative disease, to more systemic disorders like sarcoidosis, vasculitis, and thyroid disorders. To recap the framework, in a patient with elevated pulmonary pressures, you want to ask yourself, is it because the left-sided heart pressures are up, Is there high pulmonary vascular resistance? Or is there high flow across the pulmonary circulation? How can the echo clue us in to which of these three pathophysiologic buckets may be the primary cause of the high PASP? First, we want to see if the high PASP is from left-sided heart disease, which is essentially WHO group 2. The obvious red flags for left-sided heart disease include significantly reduced EF, severe aortic stenosis, or severe mitral regurgitation. 
anything that notably decreases systolic function and causes backup of fluid and pressure into the pulmonary system. But for more subtle causes, you may have to look for signs of chronic left-sided diastolic dysfunction in the echo report. Some of these findings might include increased left atrial size or an E to E prime ratio over 10 to 12. In simple terms, the E to E prime ratio essentially measures how hard it is for the left atrium to fill the left ventricle. So the higher the ratio, the more worried we are about diastolic dysfunction. If the culprit for your patient's pulmonary hypertension is elevated left-sided filling pressures, then you can treat their underlying heart disease and reevaluate the pulmonary pressures once that has been addressed, especially if you don't suspect any other concomitant conditions. And if you've ruled out a problem with the end of the nozzle, we can start looking for kinks in the hose, aka increased resistance, or causes of high flow that may be underlying the elevated pulmonary pressures. So if we think about the things that increase resistance, it will be diseases within WHO groups 1, 3, and 4. Within WHO group 1, check for pulmonary arterial hypertension. We can start screening for this by asking about a family history of hereditary PAH or connective tissue diseases, and we can also ask about symptoms that may suggest Raynaud's, refractory GERD, or skin thickening that may clue you into underlying scleroderma. You'd also want to test for HIV and underlying liver disease and ask about any drug or toxin exposures, especially methamphetamine use or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Next, in WHO Group 3, we're thinking about chronic lung diseases or chronic hypoxemia. You'd want to look and see if there's any prior PFTs or chest CTs. And if you don't have that information, you can also start with a chest x-ray and order a sleep study to evaluate for sleep apnea. And you also want to think about WHO group 4, which includes chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, also known as CTEF. To screen for this, you need to do a VQ scan first. And if you're suspecting increased pulmonary vascular resistance as the cause of a patient's elevated pulmonary pressures, you should also refer the patient to a pulmonary hypertension specialist to continue more advanced workup. One thing to keep in mind when you see an elevated pulmonary artery systolic pressure is that there can be confounders or acute clinical changes that might also increase the PASP. Don't forget about these three factors, breathing, bloating, and blood. For breathing, think about hypoxia, pneumonia, pleural effusions, or pneumothoraces. Any sort of acute pulmonary process that causes vasoconstriction or loss of the lung vasculature can increase pressure in the pulmonary circulation. For bloating, Here, volume overload can increase that tricuspid regurgitation we use to actually estimate the PASP and can cause an increase in that value. And for blood, in patients with acute anemia, there can be a rise in cardiac output and thus a rise in PASP. So to recap and cement, let's quiz ourselves. What are the limitations of the PASP? PASP on echo provides a ballpark estimate. If you really want to know how these patients are doing over time, look at how the right side of the heart adapts to those elevated pressures. Is there right ventricular hypertrophy, enlargement, or RV dilatation? What causes elevated pulmonary artery pressures? Remember that garden hose analogy and ask, is there high flow? Is there high vascular resistance? Or are the left-sided heart pressures up? How can the echo help you work up pulmonary hypertension? Elevated left-sided filling pressures is a very common cause, so start by looking for obvious causes of systolic dysfunction, like bad valvular disease or low ejection fraction, and then for more subtle signs of diastolic dysfunction, like an enlarged left atrium or E to E prime ratio greater than 10 to 12. On the other hand, if you suspect increased pulmonary vascular resistance, take a thorough rheumatologic and drug exposure history including methamphetamine use and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. You can also check for old PFTs and any lung imaging you may have. Screen for HIV and maybe order a VQ scan for CTEF, depending on where you are, and have a low threshold for getting that sleep study. And lastly, what are some acute clinical scenarios that might affect the PASP? Elevated PASP doesn't always equal pulmonary hypertension. Don't forget about the three Bs 
breathing, bloating, and bleeding that can cause an acute rise in the pulmonary pressures. That was a deep dive into pulmonary hypertension, but we hope we helped put some of that echo report jargon into greater context. I'm Dr. Hannah Robertson. Credit to the authors and peer reviewers on the bottom, and to Dr. Tony Chan for helping with the whiteboard animation. Thank you for learning with us, and join us again for another rapid review from our Five Pearls series.